Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first lecture of the semester. Um, today, we have a special guest. Leslie Witt is the Chief Product and Design Officer at Headspace Health, the world's most comprehensive, accessible, and effective mental health and well being platform. Prior to Headspace, Leslie's focus was on improving financial outcomes for clients that include Intuit, Visa, Wells Fargo, MetLife, the Gates Foundation, and uh, CFPB and the World Bank. So yeah, with that, Leslie, please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone. I'm thrilled to get to be here with you today, um, digital and, and beyond. So um, I'm gonna share a, a little bit of a personal story with you today and um, ask that you hold questions, but that you have questions till the end and you're free to post them in the chat throughout. So eager to engage in a bit of a dialogue. So let me pull my presentation up. All right, can you guys see that? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, awesome. All right, so thank you for the introduction, Chelsea. I'm gonna give myself a little bit more of a long form version. So um, I was a Midwestern nomad, born in Indiana, then quickly moved 13 times growing up throughout the entire central swath of the US, um, went to, University at Rice down in Houston, then out to grad school at Princeton, where I met my husband, and we said, go west, young man, and have been in California ever since. So I think this explains a little bit of my friendliness. I got used to being new, used to settling into different places, and you will catch that ever so slight Texas drawl. Um, I was a trumpeter, I'm now a piano player, and uh, the drum major, for those of you who didn't grow up in the, in the Midwestern US, that's the person that stands in front of the band and directs them. Um, and I think that that explains a little bit of why I am loud and a little bit bossier in modern parlance directive. Uh, I used to be an architect of the uh, build buildings kind. Uh, this is a project I had the pleasure to work on that's in the Phaedon Atlas of Contemporary Art and Architecture. And that world kind of lives with me in my love of detail, my obsessive compulsive love of diagrams, and in that uh, kind of architect's pitfall that you capture so many people in, which is that tendency to be verbose and quite grandiose. I love to make things. I love to craft and create. I think everything should be a project and I make everything into one. This was a eight foot by 12 foot curtain at my wedding many moons ago, composed by all of the response cards that people had gotten. And, and those who had received like a awkward swath of my husband's fleshy neck were quite pleased to see the thing reassembled and had been marveling at their you know, fleshy bit of postcard in the meanwhile. I'm a huge gardener. Uh, this is probably like the most unfair capture of my yard on its like most productive day in the last 10 years. But part of the joy of California is that, you know, you stick something into the ground and it grows and produces. And part of the joy of gardening is that there's this reciprocity between yourselves and the plants in the most un- anxiety inducing way. The, the more you give them, the more they give back to you. You can feel the mutuality and yet it comes with kind of an endless patience and a timelessness. So if you aren't yet into gardening, I highly recommend it. I am a teacher right now more in spirit than actuality and I'm a bit of a reformed academic. Um, this is the last studio that I had the pleasure to teach. It was a um, hybrid studio at Stanford with the UN High Commission on Refugees, looking at how we could reshape the refugee experience. Um, this is a picture of one of the largest refugee camps in the world, the Dab. And being a part of this and looking at kind of the systemic challenges of you know, repatriation, which is really a myth. Most people kind of live out their lives in this in-between political status. This brought to the foreground like why it matters to take a rigorous analytical toolkit and a designer's toolkit and really blend them together. Um, but you know, underpinning that zeal to teach, that zeal to reform is a desire for impact. And hopefully you'll be able to see how that's threaded throughout um, what is a bit of the sort of serendipitous flow and shifts of, of my career. Um, I'm a mom to twins, Ella and Gray. 
Um, this is them kind of sporting some of their um, COVID cool. We were part of the endless brigade of early birthday parties, uh, you know, done from the car. And I think that explains why I'm often tired, but I tend to be smiling. They're, um, they're a lot to deal with and really, really, really fun. Um, I was the head of design for QuickBooks. Um, that's a tool that really serves the needs of small businesses and the self-employed. And for me, it was where I learned how to actually build a global offering and to build a, a, a true design culture, both with my team, which was around 300 designers, but also as a mechanism to drive alignment and change in a broader organization. And lastly, I'm the Chief Product and Design Officer at Headspace, as Chelsea uh, shared, uh, which may explain why I'm here with all of you today. So that's kind of been my standard intro. Like, and I thought that for this purposes, you all deserved more, more of a behind the scenes look. Like, great, how does that constellation of random factoids actually knit together? And, and what might it mean to you as you're embarking on your career? I thought I'd start with the personal. So I am mom to twins, Ella and Gray. Um, and you know, I shared that's both a daily joy and a daily pain. And for me, it's the closest I've come to a miracle, as well as um, the biggest hardship that I've yet ever had to confront and overcome. So, uh, you know, here's them and their miraculously cute selves. This was many moons ago at this point, captured by my brother-in-law in our backyard. Here's them about a year and a half earlier in the NICU. Um, they came seven weeks early, 33 weeks one day, which is a little before you actually want your babies to show up, um, but they could breathe on their own, which was a huge relief to us because although they're our first and only babies, they weren't our first and only pregnancy. This is um, a picture of my husband and I out on a hike the day that we learned that we'd lost our fourth baby. Um, we lost five. We never figured out why. Um, we ended up kind of deploying all of the tools of, you know, belief in art and science in order to get to a place where we had the ability to actually become parents and fulfill, fulfill our dreams of, you know, kind of embarking on that journey. And I bring it up here because for me, and, you know, maybe this is apropos to you, I'd always been a great student. I had a supportive family. I got great jobs having attended a great program and great university. And it was the first time in my life I ever had to deal with true hardship. And um, I fundamentally believe it made me a better parent, um, but more than that, a better human being who could actually look at struggle and challenge and perseverance, not in an abstract empathetic way, but in a truly deep and empathic sense. And it makes me a better manager and leader every moment. Um, on to something a little lighter. I do love to craft and create. And I come from a really long line of artists and makers and craftspeople and people whose creativity both fueled them and quite honestly, honestly drained them. Um, even you might say was the death of them in certain cases. And so I always like think of mental health, the space I'm in now, infused with the creative zeal um, as two things that need to be um, approached in tandem. So just a little bit. My mom, this is, is a watercolorist. Um, she's president of the Watercolor Society in Austin. And for her, art is, an, is, is a continuous act of joy and accident and discovery, which for someone like myself trained as an architect, it's always like um, almost like uncomfortable to see the level of lack of planning and yet kind of delightful outcome that results from her approach. She's from a line of makers. This is a fountain in San Piero Patti, Sicily, where her grandmother, her grandfather is from. And when he was a young man, he became a stonemason. And the fountain that he carved is still a bit of a family pilgrimage. He left Italy when he was in his early 20s and emigrated to the US. And like many immigrants before him, with that possibility that he was investing for the future came a huge demotion in his present. And so he did carve. But his entire body of work moving forward was oriented towards carving tombstones. So I always think about that, like this, this, these moments of grandeur and possibility and 
potential and the the size of the box that an artist and a creator is equipped to play in. And it was pretty delightful to get to see that when he was given a large box, even as a young man, what created. That's my husband, the one kind of with his mouth open and, and waving his hand. He's also a design leader. He's the VP of design at a group called Next Team that uses augmented reality to track all sorts of movement. Here, this was them in a kind of glory moment on stage at Apple. Um, it's interesting to be in the same field as your spouse um, and not share a last name. And you can ask me follow up questions on that, but it's a it's a funny thing when people don't actually realize you're related. His father was a designer. His father was a corporate identity designer who has some logos that are still around. His, his dad sadly died when Ian was 13 um, after he had had quite a successful career in business of his own in San Francisco hit the skids during the recession of the late 70s, one many moons before any of you were born, and had to fold up shop. And this, this was for a person who had a lot of ego wrapped up in their productive works, right? At a time when the name of a design firm was your name. And as G. Dean Smith, he had designed the Yosemite label, the Channel 7, which you'll still see today, Corn Nuts, like, you know, like these iconic brands. Um, and because he'd been so successful, he was offered a job leading corporate identity for Saul Bass, who is, for those of you who are in communication design and brand and identity, he was, you know, a, a pretty famous identity designer himself, but also more than that, um, really grew fame for his um, foray and the credits and a lot of his uh, kind of Hollywood and movie poster art. Um, during the time that Dean was his head of corporate identity, he designed the AT&T logo and the General Foods logo, and a lot of things that people could be quite proud of. But I always look at this, we have the real type drawer hung on our wall at home. And I think about sort of the, the ego and the hubris that combine to be able to make these things and, and how much that actually tormented him. Uh, it tormented his father as well. So you'll actually see these right behind me. That's my, they're, they're hanging on our wall. This is my husband's grandfather who was a painting professor at the Chicago Art Institute. That's a picture of his grandmother in the middle who was scandalously enough, his grandfather's student. Um, and he, he was quite the painter, um, but then they hit the depression. And during the depression, there were a lot of opportunities to go commercial as an artist, uh, you know, fueled by things like the WPA programs. But his grandfather actually had too much pride. And so the family history kind of departs from art at that point in time, at least for a bit. And his grandmother went on to be a shop owner. And quite honestly, his grandfather went on to be an alcoholic. And so sh sharing this with you, because there's, there's these sort of grand narratives and these grand aspirations and the ego and the hubris, which help drive achievement, but also um, have, have often kind of led to a narrative of um, unsustainability and personal collapse. And so I think about that a lot when I see the creativity of my two. Um, like all kids, they're joyous in their creations. They're incredibly proud of what they make. And there's this natural confidence to what they do. And so we always talk about how to consciously foster that in a way that drives um, a healthy, happy outcome for themselves and, and for the world that they hope to change. Uh, I was an architect. I love buildings, like love, love them. I love architectural thinking. I loved being an academic and I absolutely hated being an architect. Um, I was 10 years in, I had three degrees. I was ready to be licensed. I'd practiced for years um, and, and I just didn't wanna be one anymore. And this is a really hard thing to confront, particularly I would say for folks who maybe like yourselves, I'm projecting, um, have always been great at achieving like getting that A in the class, doing really well at whatever you've put your mind to, sticking with it, right? A lot of the values that we have around perseverance. And so I, I kept kind of circling around to this and it quite honestly took um, the collision of a really bad boss to push me over the edge and make me just sort of stare at my reality and accept it, which is 
Um, I can't make this my life's work. Um, it has value unto itself. And that value lives on in an extensible practice, but not as a practice as an architect. And so thankfully, back in 2005, which you guys maybe were in elementary school by then, but maybe not even, <laughs> um, I left the field of architecture and at my uh, soon to be husband's behest applied to a company called IDEO. Um, IDEO had, you know, had this famous shopping cart video and the world of design thinking and customer driven innovation, user research was really just burgeoning. And a lot of the kind of top level brand credit for that was due to IDEO. I had never heard of them, but thankfully they happened to just be expanding their environments practice and were looking for uh, people who could 3D model well. And so I bring that up because there wasn't any grand strategic alignment between philosophies. There was actually a sort of, uh, I had a deep technical skill set that they needed, and that was my entree in. And, and when I first joined, I did the types of projects that you might imagine, like new concept retail stores for Nike, um, hospitality spaces for hospitals and, and medical conditions, rethinking the interior of navigation and plane experiences for Air New Zealand. And, you know, largely, although there were deeper strategic underpinnings to these, I was sort of being a lightweight architect within IDEO's folds. And I was two years in and my boss came to me and said, hey, we have this great financial services project in Japan. Um, I, I think you're perfect for it. Why don't you do it? I, I was like, oh, yeah, no thanks. I don't find banking interesting at all. Um, you know, I'd rather do myself another Nike project, like, you know, get me on that horse. And he, he looked at me, gentleman, Fred Dust, um, pretty amazing boss. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wasn't really asking you this. I was telling you. And he's like, look, worst comes to worst. You'll have three weeks in Tokyo. Enjoy it. But I actually hope you like dive in. And boy, did I. Um, I, I ended up, this is 2006, the summer of 2006, over in Japan, and confronting for the first time the fact that the entire world of money exchange, money transfer, money savings, money growth is constructed, and largely it's constructed poorly. It's so omnipresent in our mental models of risk and safety and exchange. And this was right at the time, you know, I think we were about six months away from the launch of this guy where we would all suddenly be carrying around, you know, massive computing power in our pockets. And I fell in love. I fell in love with the complexity. I fell in love with the possibility. I fell in love with the very humanity of the problem. Most people hate dealing with their money, which is like an awesome challenge for designers to confront. And I just started to change every project into a financial service project. So I was working on um, this is a program with the largest builder of low income housing in the US and I turned it into like a overall systemic overhaul of their financial service offerings I was working with Walmart to define a wellness um, strategy and it became a lot about how do you actually evolve money services so that capacity is increased. Um, and, and I kept coming back again and again and again to it, um, to the point that I established a practice focused on designing for money. Um, and really focused attentions on how money services could evolve to meet the needs of the world's poor and you know, the, the dimension of where financial services become financial inclusion. I was having a pinnacle moment. I was providing the keynote address in Turin in 2014 for MasterCard's foundation on, um, symposium on financial inclusion. I brought my husband with me. We ditched our three-year-old twins and I, I had this realization I was phoning it in. I had become like a retired professor who was, you know, kind of rinse repeating a set of processes without fundamentally challenging my own beliefs and without growing. And so we were clinking glasses in Turin and, and I, I said, I, I'm going to, I'm going to change. I'm going to jump in and go corporate. And so that became my next chapter. So I, I left the, the utopia, which was IDEO, this incredible safety of being surrounded by creative professionals with the same worldview, and jumped into a mission-driven corporation, but a corporation 
where the question marks around your value are deeper, but the challenges to being able to act in translation and to be the shepherd of your own ideas, be those organizational or offering wise was so much more real and fell in love. Oh, for some reason, it keeps going backwards. I'm not sure what I did, but let's see. Is that gonna go forward? Yeah, so I fell in love with this. Real people and having to be accountable to them in this case, they were small business and the self-employed, very practical, um, immense set of problems and a huge amount of time pressure. They had very real problems. This is pre-pandemic, 50% failing within five years. And even when they were thriving, so many cash flow problems that they often ended up in a position where the better they did, the worse off they were. And our product was there to actually de develop with real impact less work, more money in their pockets, more confidence to act. I'm gonna give you like the lightest highlight reel. This was from my last year there, which was about a year and a half ago where we launched um, a digital assistant to help people actually um, kind of drive awareness and take action, a cash flow prediction tool to help people understand not just where they were today, but where their money would be in the future and how to um, take action uh, before and against that. Um, and then live services, really starting to bridge in a hybrid capacity, the digital and the physical world. So awesome. It was very, very fulfilling. And then COVID happened. And I ended up, like many of you, staring at myself in a screen 10 hours a day, stepping out of the social momentum of work and having another one of those moments, realizing that I wasn't maximizing my own value and growth. I wanted to be closer to improving the human condition, um, which is why I went to Headspace. Hi, and welcome to Headspace, your guide to meditation and mindfulness. Think of Headspace as your mind's best friend. It's here for you whenever you need it, helping you stress less, sleep soundly, and stay resilient during tough times. There are many ways to use Headspace, and all of them will help you feel healthier and happier. Start by checking out the Today tab, where we'll recommend a range of things for you to try each day. Meditation is what we're known for, and there are hundreds to choose from. Even three minute sessions for when you're short on time. You can search for a meditation that fits your mood or start with the basics course. It's great for beginning. So I'm gonna skip through that. Um, Headspace, it, it, it's an awesome platform. We have a ton of content. Um, we're always refreshing it. And here's the thing I discovered as I stepped in. Here's our mission. Our mission is to improve the health and happiness of the world. It's a bold mission. We have some really robust tools to help with that and they weren't enough. So here's, here's the reality. And again, these stats are actually a little outdated at this point. If, if anything, each one of these has gotten worse. So we're in a global mental health epidemic. And these are stats kind of right at the beginning of COVID. It, it, has, it is amplified, but we're looking at one third of American adults suffering from anxiety and depression. All signs point towards the fact that um, this is amplified for young adults and youth, particularly given the world situation. Um, 50 to 70 million US adults having insomnia and so many studies to look at the concomitant results of poor sleep on chronic conditions, physical health, diabetes, blood pressure, et cetera. Um, 75% of those mental health issues beginning before the age of 25. Um, and this stat isn't on here, but the, it, it floats. I've seen it be seven years, 11 years, whether it's seven years or 11 years, that's the current gap in time between the onset of a mental health problem and the receipt of any direct mental health treatment. And so what we were finding with a really inviting brand that kind of dabbled next to the mental health space was that people were coming to us, potential members were coming to us in clinical states of stress, anxiety, and depression, and not in a place where self-serve well-being content could actually put them back on the right foot. They needed more. 
They needed connection to coaches. They needed connections to therapists, to psychiatrists, potentially even to um, medication. And we were basically kind of leaving them stranded because they'd come seeking help very generally, and we could not provide that set of services. So fast forward, I'm gonna just skip through this, looking at time, um, looking at the broader world. Again, these are stats pre-COVID. We're still kind of getting some of the, 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 the COVID results, but mental health services near me, Google search query volume. Um, this is a, a Rock Health is a big player in digital health tech. And this is a slide they created on behavioral health funding. They still haven't finalized for 2021. 2021, third quarter, $3.1 billion put in in venture capital to mental health tech. And the reason being that there is a massive gap between need and ability to scale to meet. So in this world, about Five months ago, we purchased a company called Ginger and we became Headspace Health. And Headspace Health is really this continuum kind of coming back to the very start where Chelsea began that takes the best of Headspace, the mindfulness content, the meditation, the behavior formation that's really help, helping both kind of be a preventive and a lightweight curative. And, seams it together with ginger coaching and teletherapy services. So bringing recommendation sleep and mindful movement together with the, the best of um, therapy, psychiatry and guided self-care. And we're still at the beginning of this journey. I just came out right before I joined this call today from a planning session where we're pitching to get funding in order to actually build the deep and true integration so that these aren't two services that can meet your need but really a continuum of care. Um, but that's what I get up for now every morning. The, the fact that mental health is a lifelong journey and that we are one of the rare companies to have an opportunity to actually play at developing a lifelong approach for people of all ages around the world. So that's me, the, I, my, my kind of career journey in a nutshell and hopefully provided some interesting fodder for you that you could relate to. And I'd love to stop sharing and open it up for questions. All right. If you guys have questions, you can either unmute yourself and directly ask, or you could type it in the group chat and I'll just read it all out. Oh, I see somebody asked St. Louis. I, I uh, went to high school in St. Louis. If anyone is also a, a St. Louisan, um, I was public school girl uh, out in the Parkway school system in Chesterfield. You guys have to have some questions. Chelsea, uh, I have a question. Or, oh, go I have a question. Thank yeah. you for your talk, Lisa. This is great. It's good. It's nice to virtually meet you too. Um, I don't. I don't know if this is fully fledged yet, but I guess there's you, your career kind of had two paths. Like one that was like like the beginning, which is more creative. I, I would say in a way, and this is like a path of agency, and now it's more mission driven. So yeah. I guess what are your thoughts on like the pros and cons of each, and and people who are like looking to graduate, like what might yeah. you recommend to think about as they look at different places? Yeah. First of all, I don't think you can go wrong. I, I think as long as you're open to maximizing what you can get out of any environment and being willing to, to re reflect on when you might have maximized the usefulness of that place for yourself, like world's your oyster. What I would say I got from consulting that is very hard to replicate in-house is a breadth of exposure to different industries and experiences, as well as the necessity of presenting, even as a relatively junior um, creative to C-suite execs and having to learn how to translate creative intention and even kind of product innovation into business outcomes that aligned with their strategies. And that toolkit is incredibly valuable once you're in-house, but I think harder to acquire because of the, you know, just the nature of hierarchy. Um, I think what you get in-house is a great level of accountability for outcome 
in a rigor around everything from um, planning and operations to uh, impact. And that, that accountability is hard to come by in a consultancy, right? Because a lot of times you're sort of gifting your idea onto a different shepherd. And so you have very little um, feedback loop in terms of what actually worked. That makes sense. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah. Leslie, this isn't a question. It's more of a um, comment compliment. I, I just feel the way you talked about making in the beginning of your lecture, the way you tied so many different things together and, and brought it back to your children was, um, was wonderful. I'm glad this lecture is recorded so that we can, we can have that and, and play that back. So thank, oh, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question if no one else has questions. Like, uh, I guess like throughout your career, you've like sort of like pivoted so many times and like, it's really amazing to see you doing that. And I'm wondering like each time you pivot, like how do you like choose what the next like direction is, I guess? Yeah, um, I'm a really geeky planner. And so, you know, in this last pivot, for instance, I made a, a pretty broad spreadsheet that outlined for myself what I wanted and scored my existing job against it in tandem with areas that I would pursue. And so, you know, I was really looking at things um, particularly oriented towards social impact at this point. Like what are, you know, is this the world's most pressing problem? Does technology have an outsized role in playing it? Like what level of um, maturity is the market in? And looking at what of these things um, are inherent to like a, a system, like, like I would say mental health or say ed innovation, what are specific to a particular organization and what would be my locus of control? And so one thing that I have been very adamant about uh, throughout my corporate career uh, is that I need to be in a position where I can drive choices versus just influence them. And I, you know, I would say like, that's, that's a privilege that you graduate to at a, a different point in your career, but th there are dimensions, particularly for design professionals, where a company might hire you with the best of intention, but unequipped from an operational standpoint to actually drive decision making and investment. And I found that just for my own personal passions around product innovation, um, and organic growth, that that's an unsatisfying position to be in. And I, I know enough people who have gone down that path to kind of be able to exclude. So, you know, really kind of creating a set of matrices. For me, I was looking at mental health, ed tech, um, caregiving, and um, what I, I had an awkward title for it, but basically like how do we use technology to create democracy rather than ruin it? Um, and, you know, really seeking out roles within companies that I thought had the chance to make a profound impact and then balancing the potential against each other. So kind of in a no rush capacity, um, making a choiceful decision about my next. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question. Hi, Eleanor. I see, I see. I was like, I always have to honor the hand raised for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Les Leslie. And um, thank you, Chelsea, for moderating. Um, I thank you so much for being here. I have really loved your discussion so far and um, just want to say how much I appreciate the way you started your discussion, talking, talking about your family and your experiences. I think um, that just demonstrates someone walking the walk if you work for a mental health company um, and just appreciate your, your vulnerability. Um, kind of a, a, a piggyback off of Chelsea's question, as you're thinking about um, making your next career move and the kinds of companies you want to work for. I feel like all of us here want to work for a, a company that aligns with their values. And I think you can look into those more social impact oriented spaces like ed tech or, or mental health and the, you know, the title of the company seems to align, but then you, you get in there and you're not quite sure. Um, and so I'm curious, like how you parse that out in the interview process, in the process of meeting people at the company, like how do you really assess um, when a company is aligned with your values? 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I'm going to sort of answer it. I'm, I'm going to give you two stories. Um, one is that the most mission driven project team, I won't necessarily give credit to the company that I've ever worked at shocked the hell out of me. And it was the team that I worked with at Walmart. And I actually had, I, I raised my hand to lead the Walmart strategy project because I had written a diatribe, like a, like a 30 page essay against the evils of Walmart when I was an undergrad. And I was like, oh, like I, they, they want us to do a wellness strategy for them. Like, this is such like fundamental bullshit. Like I cannot even believe it. And I got schooled because I had been working with Gates Foundation and World Bank and, you know, very mission driven companies. Who, who lived up to that promise, but quite honestly, didn't have the ability to drive change at scale. And what I found was that you're often needing to step aside from purism, but really be able to engage with what is, what's the change I'm looking to drive? Am I going to be enabled to actually do that in this forum? And am I aligned with people who are wanting to drive the same set of changes? And so I would say is, first of all, when you're looking, um, peek behind the covers. It's not always the most obvious groups that are actually driving the most outsized change or necessarily even have uh, affiliated values. The other thing I would say is, is a little bit more apropos to where I'm at now in my career, which is that I take a lot of responsibility for the fact that um, I am a big driver of creating the values alignment and culture that is what the company should be living up to. And I think that as you're exploring places, getting a sense of how empowered, not just aligned, but how empowered the leadership is to receive feedback and take action to drive change and self-correct, I'd take that any day over a company that sort of has the appearance of um, perfection because inevitably new problems will arise and what you really need is a responsive and engaged leadership team. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Dorcas. Hi, Leslie, it's super good to have you here. Um, I'm really curious, like teletherapy really blew up kind of these last two years. And I'm curious, like from your perspective as a designer, is there an unexpected challenge that comes in the design process that you've noticed that you know, isn't necessarily on the surface or what people might think immediately with the issue of teletherapy or some of the pros and cons? Yeah, um, that great question. I mean, telehealth in general has ex exploded, right? Um, and the fact that we all got locked down and were deathly afraid of an unknown virus was a huge accelerant. It also created a regulatory environment that allowed those changes to happen qu more quickly than they would have. Um, from a design perspective, some of the things that have really, um, I don't know if surprised is the right wor word, but I get humbled again and again by is the level of complexity of like data management and um, quality oversight. And, you know, that playing in a healthcare space is so um, ethically important to ensure that you've created a system that treats your member and your patient's data with the utmost care um, while providing the level of clinical oversight that ensures that you're giving um, quality provisions to all and, and figuring out how to balance those um, systemically and from a um, design engagement perspective is, is really tough and it's essentially invisible to the end user. So th that's probably my biggest one. Yeah, Katie. Hi, um, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us about kind of your journey. Um, I'm interested kind of like, I guess, how you approach thinking about um, like the humanity of uh, products and problems while also having to balance uh, business outcomes and metrics like KPIs. Um, and I feel like it, particularly at inflection points where like uh, either the company is raising capital or with acquisitions and kind of like that re-strategizing um how you approach that yeah it's a it's, it's a fantastic question and i think it's one that you have to continuously ask yourself um this is where i think into it which is the company i work at when i led quickbooks um ex excelled and we had a framework that they just drilled into all executives that we called our true north framework and it put 
our KPIs into three buckets. One, the first one was employees. The second one was customers. And the third was business or shareholders. And our CEO would talk about those three buckets in this way. And he, he always talked about like our true north and our body of metrics is uh, it's, a, it's the corporate body. And it needs air, it needs water, and it needs food. Well, it turns out employees are your air. Because if these are not healthy, then we have no future. And a body can survive without air, but it can survive without air for about three minutes. And so as managers, when you're looking at this constellation of metrics, this is your most important one to make sure like we do not like lose track of. Your second bucket is your customer. And you should not confuse business metrics with customer value metrics. And so I, I happen to like awkwardly skip past the slide, but one of our big efforts at Intuit was to articulate like what really, why are people buying us, right? They're not buying you ever. And this is the same thing at Headspace to do things like engage or content complete or convert, right? A lot of these metrics that get used as proxies for user value, but actually don't deliver core user value. They, in the space of Intuit, hired us to take more money home, to sleep better at night, <laughs> to be able to pay their employees on time. And so me measuring member value and articulating it was key, but also treating it like water. And it turns out you can live without water, but you can only live without water for about three days. And so then in that last bucket came shareholder metrics. And these are important, right? Like they're food, you can, but you can live without food for about three weeks. And so articulating what those me metrics were and separating true customer value from business value um, and, and having a triage and a framework of language to understand it, I think is, is critical. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of questions in the chat. Okay. <laughs> I'll just read them out loud one by one. So from Luke, um, did you ever run into the problem of ego for yourself that you mentioned in other people's lives? How did you navigate thinking about it? If so, uh, that you arrived at a constructive outcome? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I My entire first 10 years of life was oriented towards being a architecture professor. And no offense to any of your architecture professors, if you have some, but uh, ego and architecture professor go very well together. Um, there's a lot about sort of the brand itself, um, your your identity, right? Like it, the, the, the lecture would be Leslie Witt of Leslie Witt Architects. And that I even think like name collision of having things brought into the world, holding your name it becomes very hard to not have a deep level of personal association. And, and not all ego is bad. And I'm not by any stretch of the imagination trying to say that that is a wrong way to play. But I realized that for my own self, it wasn't the relationship that I wanted to have as a designer with my creation and my desire to kind of work with and scale through others. That I was, I was fueled um, through collaboration, I was fueled by creating things that, yes, had my imprint on them, but that that might never be known to history. And being able to work in that anonymous capacity to and through others and to and through a brand uh, was something that felt um, far more scalable and sustainable and for me actually more desirable in terms of the impact I'd like to have and how. Thank you. Um, uh, next question from Eileen. How do you feel validated in the work that you do, especially when it's not always immediately apparent what impact your design has for your users or when you're unsure if your design would have the great impact you're hoping for? Um, well, I question the, the, the notion of things not being immediately apparent. Um, I fell in love. I mean, I, I one of the reasons I got into architecture was that I was a math geek and like, you know, traveling math team. I've always loved numbers. Um, I, I love numbers and architecture through the very like thisness of making things. What I've fallen in love with in the world I've now been in for 15 years is 
falling in love with the creation of a metric as a mechanism to evaluate the change that you're making and to do so at the level of a quick prototype that asks a question that can be validated or invalidated that presents you back with information and in the frame of being able to introduce new ideas to the world. And it doesn't mean, like I mentioned with the metrics framework when I was responding to Katie's question, it doesn't mean that you're data driven. It doesn't mean that all of those metrics are business metrics, but figuring out like, how will I know that I was successful? Like, what are the things that I'm going to look at in order to gauge the efficacy of this design? Uh, and, and so I, I would highly encourage you to like let yourself step into that world because it puts so much um, control and so much power of feedback to help you question your own assumptions um, and, and understand how successful you are in a truly like extrinsic way. Thank you. Um, uh, from Dorothy, she says, thank you for sharing your experience and especially your story. Um, I heard you first went into IDEO because they valued your hard skills like 3D modeling. I wonder what other skills do you think are really important? Also, do you have any advice for us moving from an academic environment to a corporate environment and many other complex environments in this big, big world outside of school? Yeah, I, I love the question. I brought this one up because um, I strongly believe in acquiring deep technical skills. Um, and that doesn't mean that you stay anchored in them. And it doesn't mean that they're exclusive because I would actually say my biggest personal skill set and what's allowed me to thrive is that I, um, I'm a good talker and that, that uh, ability to synthesize facts, to present them in a, you know, in a grokable unified and inspiring framework is probably the core skill that helped me thrive in retrospect in architecture and, you know, and earlier, and then has helped me um, have the ability to navigate my career with, with some level of intention and, you know, lean into dynamism and change. And so I think, you know, if you've heard of the T-shaped model, I think a lot of times what that really is, is there's a lot of, a lot of T's and the, the cross arm is really about um, having the capacity to act in translation and to express your intent in such a way that it can manifest and matter to other people. Um, I will share with you this, which is no one will ever know all of the skills that you bring to the table. You are your best advocate. And so my advice for you kind of moving from an academic environment to a corporate environment is that your academic environment has been idealized around the thing that you're learning, the people that you're learning with, share a same set of vocabulary, the people you're learning from already value this thing. You're, you're being hired not into an alien organization that doesn't care, but it's bringing you know, 30 other disciplines to the foreground. And so you want to make sure that you're bringing your A game in the capacity that you've been hired to do, but that you're keeping your awareness and feelers open around the broad range of things that no one may know that you actually excel at. Like maybe you're an excellent videographer or you're an incredible writer, or you actually have quite the zeal for marketing and comms. The company will be eager to capitalize on whatever skill you bring to the table, but they won't know to ask for it. And so a lot of the onus will be on you and to work to and through and with your managers and your peers to be able to say like, hey, wait a second, like I actually am pretty good at this and I wanna try it out and to feel empowered to do so. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, another question from Lokesh. Um, uh, they have an ethical question. Uh, behavior formation through design is great but can cause certain ethical implications often unintentionally. Being a mental well-being product, such issues might come out to be even more critical for Headspace. How do you manage behavior formation through Headspace while being ethical and mindful about the implications that a behavior forming product might have on the people who use the app? No, it's, it's a great question. And, and I think anytime you're playing in the space of um, dealing with quite honestly any population, but especially dealing with folks who are, have some level of um, fragileness, and, and, and we do have that in terms of folks who are seeking us out. 
um, you have to be incredibly intentional. Um, so one way, just practically speaking, is that I have a science team who are composed of clinical psychologists and you know folks with deep PhD level backgrounds who help hold a rigor around um, both how we engage and what we engage on, um, as well as the measurements that we're taking. And so kind of coming back again to that measurement framework, when it comes to member value for us, we're looking to ensure that we understand, did we actually help you become less stressed? Are you sleeping better? Um, if your intent was to, um, you know, kind of from whatever hallmark you're judging it, kind of get to a place where you are happier, more engaged and more focused, how are we baselining that? Then how are we tracking your progress against it so that we can check not just at the level of an individual, if we're actually enabling you to achieve your own expressed goals, um, but are we doing so in such a way that's inclusive and equitable? And so increasingly we're leaning into collecting more demographic information to understand for whom we are helping to drive positive change and is and you know kind of course correcting where there might be gaps um, uh, driven really by kind of lack of attention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lokesh. Sounds good. Um, any last minute questions <laughs> before we wrap up? Well, if you guys think of anything, um, please feel free to like shoot me a line. You can always find me on LinkedIn and I, I gave you my Headspace email as well. Oh, I think Audrey might have a, a question. Last question from Audrey. Yes, hello. Thank you so much for your beautiful talk. I was wondering, what does your day-to-day -day look like and what teams do you, um, what teams do you work with and what um, backgrounds do they come from and how do you make sure that everyone with a different background uh, can work well together to yeah. your goal. My day, I wake up at five. I'm like a farmer girl through and through. I uh, do endless word games. So for Wordle has joined our clash, but I do the New York Times crossword every morning, the spelling bee, and then I do an expert Sudoku. So I, I may not always get my exercise in, but I get my cognitive exercise and then um, do a little work. I stop working at seven and get my kids ready for school. Um, and then I hop on and usually do meetings from about eight to five with my team um, and my collaborators. So um, my team proper, you know, as chief product and design officer uh, has all of the product management, all of the design and UX, our brand and creative team, our content team who, you know, kind of produce all of our on-platform and off-platform um, videos, recordings and podcasts, um, our social impact crew who focuses on um, teens and educators in terms of developing um, content and distribution to really um, foster a movement around mindfulness and our science team, which is you know, a group of incredibly amazing subject matter experts who help keep us collectively honest um, and driving positive impact. And so I'd say I spend about 50% of my time with my team proper and the other half with my cross-functional partners, you know, marketing, go-to-market, clinical ops, um, the CFO, the CEO, really kind of planning and, and always like, you know, rationalizing, you make a move, I make a move, and we're all really dependent on being able to work um, in some level of alignment and autonomy together and striking that right balance is, you know, what we're in a constant, you know, kind of battle to make sure we're tweaking and refining. Uh, I'm gonna ask another question. I think we have a little bit of time. Hopefully this wasn't covered, but how much of your design work on Headspace is done through the in-house team and how much is done through like outside collaborators? I know like you've, you've done some work with like Nexus and Hornet, and just from the animation front. I don't know about yeah. like yeah, yeah. other design. We have a pretty big internal, um, I don't call them an internal agency, but you know, our brand and creative team is about 35. Our, our content team is about 60 people. And so a lot of our work is done internally, um, but we, we absolutely partner with, we have, a, we have a 
commercial coming out in a few days that we are directed, but we didn't actually produce. Um, we increasingly work, particularly like in off-platform ways with our Netflix specials with other um, animation houses and really work in that way of um, kind of creative co-production. Oh, that's sweet, thanks. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, I will say this, we, we aren't ready to like, you know, post it, but we are definitely going to be hiring um, interns this summer. So I will uh, send that that link through if anybody ends up sparked and um, interested in, in coming over and, and joining us in our mission. So thank you. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for your talk. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Bye. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Thank you.